Thank you, Brian. Brian's a great guy who has lovely hair. Um, so as he said, my name is Sean Kelly, uh, but everyone calls me Stabby, and there is a story about it, but it's actually very boring, and so I can tell it later. Um, so my talk is called Embedding, It Sure Is Weird. Uh, on your card, it's called something to the effect of how I learned to stop complaining and love the strengths of the language. That didn't really fit on the title slide, so I had to condense it down just a little bit. Uh, so what am I here to talk about? Well, obviously, since it was right in that previous slide, uh, I'm here to talk about embedding. Um, what it is, how does it work, some useful ways that you can apply embedding to your code for fun and profit. Uh, fun and profit, not guaranteed. Uh, and a few ways that you can't use embedding and why. And actually, a lot of the talk kind of focuses around ways that you can't use it or ways that it doesn't work like you might expect. And there's also a whole lot of sweet pictures of my awesome dog. Uh, I love that dog. And as you'll find by the end of this talk, I am probably a little too obsessed with that dog. Um, but basically, this, this whole talk is replete with photos and examples around my dog, who is the best dog in the whole world. Um, along with the talk, there are some code examples that I'm going to go through. Um, on GitHub, under my GitHub, dabbycutu slash embedding talk, are a deeper series of examples around some of the stuff I'm going to be talking through here. Uh, either because I couldn't fit them on the slide correctly, or because just for time concerns I didn't include all of them, but I wanted to sort of make them available if people were curious. They're roughly in the order that I'm going to be talking about stuff, so you could sort of follow along with them, um, but otherwise you can just sort of look at it as ways that embedding works or doesn't work in some cases. So, embedding. The first time you come to Go and you ask somebody who knows Go and you're like, hey, how do I do inheritance? They sort of go, huh, inheritance, that's, we don't do that in Go. We have embedding. It's far superior in every single capacity. Uh, and so you might think, well, I guess it must be like embedding. I'm sorry, like inheritance, but it really isn't. Uh, and here's a fun quote for people to disagree with, and I'm sure that somebody will take a photo of this and hang me with it on Twitter, which is great. Um, but embedding is not better than what you might call classical inheritance. It's an entirely different tool for an entirely different problem. And so if we were to sort of just take a step back and define embedding and composition and inheritance, what we're talking about here, um, embedding is a way to reuse existing structs or interfaces via composition. Uh, and when you do this, you should really think more behavior and less lineage. So one of the things that you can do with classical inheritance is you can kind of define the lineage of something, um, you know, where it came from and all the things that it is as opposed to all of the behaviors that comprise that object. Uh, that said, you don't necessarily just have to think about behaviors. You can also sort of embed as a way to uh, build up your struct from first principles and to reuse other structs. So there's nothing really wrong with that at all. Um, a term that you might be familiar with, or you might not be, is sideways inheritance. And sideways inheritance is, if, if you've ever used another language like Ruby, please hold your booing, uh, Ruby has multiple ways to do inheritance. There's sort of that classical you know, parent-child relationship, but there's also these things called modules that basically exist only to add new behaviors to existing, uh, existing objects. And the way that I think about embedding with Go is that it's a lot like that sideways inheritance model. You can grab anything you want from around you and bring it into you, almost like you're giving it a warm hug, uh, but you're not really defining sort of a top-down relationship. And another way to sort of think about the right way to apply embedding, at least in my opinion, is using it to define the API of a structure and interface. So using it to define that public set of contracts that you're going to expose by reusing other things that you know already work, but you want to include in something else without having to rewrite them or um, re-implement them from scratch. So overall, how does this differ from what we might know of as a more traditional or classic inheritance game? Well, like I said, it doesn't imply or even set up or in any way support the idea of a base class or a parent or a super class or anything like that. Um, it really is the is a versus has a. So for example, a car could inherit from an automobile, uh, but it also is comprised of a set of wheels. Both of those things say two different things about a car, and neither of them are incorrect, nor are either, either of them an incorrect way to describe a car. It's just what you're trying to do, what you're trying to describe, and how you're trying to describe it matters. Method dispatch mostly works the same, but is a little different. And we'll get into a couple of examples of where this is different and how you can sort of run into some gotchas like I did when I first came to Go and I was trying to port some code and thought, oh, embedding is a replacement for inheritance, so I'll just do embedding. And then obviously nothing worked the way that I thought it should. Um, and those largely boil down to where a method or a field gets called on, where the receiver is considered. 
Uh, and another big difference would be that uh, the embedding type, so the type that embeds another type, uh, it cannot be exchanged for the embedded type. So again, in that sort of car example, or if you might want to think of, say, a corgi, that you have a function that accepts a dog, well, you can't pass a corgi into a dog function in, in Go anyways, because there's no direct relationship that says, oh, this is actually a dog, so I'm just going to pare it down to what is a dog for this function. Um, you could use it if you wanted to, but we'll go over a couple reasons why you probably shouldn't touch the embedded field after you've embedded it. So if we were to describe a dog, let's say like a beautiful corgi like this, uh, via classical inheritance, you might do it by describing the taxonomy of the dog. It is in the kingdom of Animalia, it is in the phylum of Chordata, it is in the class of Mammalia, Carnivora, Canidae, Canis, Canis lupus, Canis lupus familiaris. If anybody has written Java, this might start to seem familiar. And then finally, <laughs> you get to breed. And so finally at breed, after these seven or eight different things that we just walked through, we finally get to describe what is a corgi by all of the taxonomical things that came before it. And that's, not, that's fine. That, that's a perfectly valid way to describe the dog. Another way to describe the dog would be, I know it's a great picture, isn't it? It would be through embedding. And you could describe all the pieces of the dog. For example, it has a set of radar ears. It has a booty wiggler. It has a scratch zone. It's got some really nice dance sticks in the back. And it's got two really cool shovels in the front. There's a food grabber and then a big poofy proud tuft in the chest because that's an important part of the dog too. Neither of those are incorrect ways to describe a dog. But they're just different based on the use of that dog, based on the use of what you're trying to do. And you could even see them as complementary in some ways, because you could take a look at that taxonomy chain and you could say a Canis lupus that has domesticated behaviors embedded into it becomes a Canis lupus familiaris. So anytime that we talk about anything in Go, really, the first thing you want to do is go to the spec, because the spec is going to define what should happen, what the actual defined supported behaviors of this feature are. And the interesting thing is that the spec doesn't really say a whole lot, considering what the spec does say. Uh, if you actually count, the word embed in any of its many forms only appears nine times in the entire spec. And I know that we like to brag about the spec is kind of concise and it fits on a single web page, but that seems sparse to me. Uh, and the interesting part of that issue is that the spec actually uses ambiguous language to talk about embedding. There's actually two terms for embedding in the spec. There's embedding, and there's anonymous types or, or uh, anonymous sets, anonymous sets of methods. Um, and so if you want to find out about what the spec actually supports in terms of embedding, you can't just you know, control F embed. You have to read through a lot of different parts to get sort of the whole view. Um, but what it boils down to is a field that is declared, and this is a mouthful, by the way, a field that is declared with a type, but no explicit field name is an anonymous field, also called an embedded field, or an embedding of the type in the struct. An embedded type must be specified by a type name t or as a pointer to a non-interface type name star t. And, and this is very important, which is why it is highlighted in green, t itself may not be a pointer type. The unqualified, name type, the unqualified type name acts as the field name. And in this case, unqualified just means without the package name. So if you imported from another package, you know, pkg t is not what the field name is, it's just t. Interfaces are treated a little bit differently, but ultimately they behave very similarly. Um, an interface T may use a possibly qualified name, uh, interface type name E, in place of a method specification. This is called embedding interface E and T. It adds all exported and non-exported methods of E to the interface T. An interface type T may not embed itself or any interface type that embeds T recursively. And what I thought was interesting about this was that the spec around interfaces calls out that you can't recursively embed. But it doesn't say that for structs. The compiler, however, will absolutely not let you do it. So you can go home and you can try to embed recursive structs, but the compiler will stop you where the spec doesn't really give you any guidance. Uh, and the other thing the spec does is it defines a, a simple series of rules for determining how promotion works. Uh, and we'll talk about promotion uh, in a second. But it's very light on examples. It's very light on showing you how promotion works. It basically just gives you the dictionary definition of what Go considers to be method promotion and field promotion. So I want to address that pointer type issue. So if you have a struct like radar ears, which corgis have, uh, and you want to embed those into a corgi struct, which is a perfectly valid way to compose a dog, uh, 
you can do it either by using the radar ears directly or a pointer to radar ears. Because it's not a pointer type, it is a pointer to a type. So what would be a pointer type? Well, if you had declared a radar ear struct and you then declared another type that was based on that struct but a pointer to that struct, you have now created a pointer type. And that you are unable to embed into another struct. Now, the thing is, you don't see too much of this, I would say, in the wild. I guess I, I haven't seen too much of this in the wild, where people declare types off of other types pointers. But it is possible. But where you largely see this, at least for me, is when you try to use anything from the standard library that is a pointer type. And anything from the standard library that's a pointer type, we're largely talking arrays, slices, channels, and maps. And the interesting thing, at least about uh, trying to use a slice or an array in this capacity, it doesn't give you an error about you're embedding a pointer type and you can't do that, like it did prior with, with our custom type. It actually treats this as a syntax error. So it doesn't even really help you very much to say, hey, I see what you're doing and it's definitely wrong. It gets caught by the syntax checker first that says, oh, you can't, you can't start a field declaration with an array indexer. You have to do something else. And if you do it with a regular uh, slice uh, of, of bools or a slice of any object, it will sort of hint that maybe, maybe you wanted to do an embedded type. It will include that in the name. It will say, hey, maybe you thought you wanted to do an embedded type. You have to do it differently. But if you use, for some reason, you could, you could do this. You probably shouldn't, ever. Uh, if you did a pointer to an array or a slice of Booleans, it won't even include that last part. It gives you an entirely different message. It's close. It, again, tells you about an unexpected array indexer. But it doesn't really tell you anything else. And it doesn't even use a consistent error in terms of the first error, where it says expected field name. The second one is just expected name. So it's a little inconsistent, and it might not really point out to you what's going wrong there. But ultimately, the problem is it's just you can't do that. But what if you really, 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 really wanted to? For some, some godforsaken reason, you really want to embed an array or a slice uh, into a struct. Well, you can actually cheat a little bit. And you could declare a new type based off of that slice. And you can then embed that all you want, because it is no longer a pointer type. It is just a type that happens to be based off an existing type. And furthermore, you can add a pointer to that type that was based off of a pointer type. Again, this is not an endorsement of doing this in your code. This is not necessarily a recommended way to write Go code. This is just something that the language lets you do. And so the three things that we're going to talk about when we talk about embedding, and especially uh, how it behaves, we're going to talk about selectors, method sets, and promotion. And in the context of this talk, selectors and method sets are really only important as they behave uh, in relation to promotion. Promotion is the big thing. Selectors and method sets are important to the language as a whole. But for us right now, we're just going to define what they are just so that we can sort of talk about them. So selectors are any expression that denote a field or method available on an object. And specifically what the spec says is for a value x of type t or star t that is not a pointer or an interface type, x.f denotes the field or method at the shallowest depth. And again, highlighted because that's a very, very important term, and we're going to revisit that a few different times. The shallowest depth in t where there is such an f. If there is not exactly one f with the shallowest depth, the selector expression is illegal. And that last statement becomes very important when we get into some of the more, let's say, esoteric examples that I'm going to show you. Uh, and the simplest selector is sort of you know, t.f, so long as that's valid, so long as f exists is a valid selector. Method sets equally are also pretty simple. Uh, method sets are the collection of all available methods with a receiver of type t. So if you declare a bunch of methods on your struct, all of the methods that are available are your method set. For interfaces, it's defined even simpler. It's basically the interface exists as its own method set. The important thing here, though, is that they are sets. They are unique collections of methods. And even more so, if you try to create an ambiguous reference, if you try to have a method set that has two different methods with the same name, even if the signature differs, they will be evicted from the method set of the promoted object, of the resulting struct. They won't be present at all. Uh, and we'll get into why that is and how that sort of manifests itself. But basically, if there's any case at all where the Go compiler detects that you're trying to do something ambiguous, not create potential ambiguity, but to act on that potential ambiguity. It won't let you do it. Promotion occurs when type E is embedded into type T, such that a field or method on E 
can be accessed at, again, the shallowest depth of an instance of T. And I know I'm using a lot of single letter uh, struct names here, and this, this comes directly from the spec. Um, they're, they're very abstract and concise uh, for a reason. If E has a field or method X, and T embeds E, X is promoted only if T doesn't already contain X. So if you have uh, you know, a struct of a dog, and it has uh, radar ears, and that radar ears has a listen function on it, or a listen method on it, and the dog already has a listen method, then that, that deeper one that's being embedded won't be promoted. You'll never be able to call that directly. Promoted methods are also only ever called on their original receiver. And the interesting thing there is that you can sometimes accidentally get to the wrong receiver if you have one of those methods that's not been promoted but basically covered up by something at a higher type. And if T already contains X, it is always called on T, never on E, for the most part. And again, there are some cases where you can accidentally get to the wrong receiver. And I'll talk about an example of how I did that and blew a couple of weeks of my life uh, on a failed port of something uh, that did not quite go as expected. So a couple of examples around uh, how this sort of works. So again, you could have your radar ears, and you could have your corgi. And science has proven this to be true. Uh, both have independent cuteness levels. So you can set the cuteness level of the dog's radar ears, and you can set the cuteness level of the dog itself, and they are independent. And if you were to do this in Go, and you were to create a corgi, and you were to set its cuteness level to 100, which is the highest value, which is what they all are, that cuteness level of the corgi is set, but the radar ears are not, because the shallowest depth at which you find cuteness level is the one that receives that call. If you choose to, and again, this dovetails into the idea that once you embed something, you should probably just leave it alone. You could set the cuteness level on radar ears if you wanted to. That, however, is not going to ferry back up in any way. You're never going to be able to read through to that cuteness level from the outer scope, from that outer promoted method, or that outer promoted function, I should say, or a uh, field. It's always going to basically be isolated behind the scenes. And so once you've interacted with something, the right way to do this would be to create the corgi and pass in a fully constructed set of radar ears at the front and then leave it alone. Never touch it after the fact. And to expand on this, you can even embed more than one thing into a given struct. You're not limited to a one-to-one -one situation like you are with certain inheritance models. Uh, you can honestly embed as many types as you want that make sense for your purpose. Depending on what you're doing, however, you might not always want to embed everything that you can because it doesn't always make sense, um, but you can't even nest embeddings. You can have things that embed things that embed things that embed things, and that's, that's totally fine. Uh, methods and fields, they're always promoted upwards, and selectors always resolve down to the shallowest depth that they can. That shallowest term is very, very important when you talk about this stuff. Um, you cannot, however, embed the same thing more than once, either recursively by having something try to embed itself, or by something embeds another thing that embedded the first thing. Uh, you can't embed the same thing more than once. And one of the main reasons why you can't do it, at least at a shallow depth, why you can't take uh, a single struct and embed another struct in it twice, is the way that Go determines the name of that field, because really the embedded or the anonymous field is just another field that's sort of being treated specially for you, uh, is that the name of the type, the unqualified name of the type, becomes the field name. And so if you try to do it twice, because Go doesn't expose a way for you to declare or determine the name of the fields of, that you embed, it's ambiguous, and the compiler won't let you do it. It will block you from even entering in that, in, into, that, uh, into that realm. But what happens if you embed multiple things that result in ambiguous selectors? The compiler doesn't stop you, because there are perfectly valid reasons why you might want to embed multiple objects that just so happen to have some conflicting methods or field names, but you still want to make use of the other ones uh, that you can, or because you don't really have control and you just, for whatever reason, need to embed them. The compiler will not stop you from doing it, but what it will stop you from doing is invoking those selectors. And so let's say you wanted to be a dog breeder, because who wouldn't? Dogs are great, and if you could breed them, you would have unlimited dogs. You might start, you might start out and say, I'm going to do a Pembroke and a Cardigan, which is the other type of corgi. My dog is a Pembroke, and he's great. And you teach them how to say hello. You teach them how to say their own name, because that would be a great party trick. A dog can say its own name. Everyone would be freaked out. You, you would be the hit of the party. 
And then, because you're drunk on power, you decide to create a super corgi that is an embedded combination of both the Pembroke and the cardigan that has the best features of both into one adorable, lovable ball of fluff. And so you create your super corgi, and you pass in a Pembroke named Bark Ruffalo, and you pass in a cardigan named Bark Hamel. And if you go to do anything with that super corgi, like say, have it speak its own name, or just find out what its name was, the compiler is going to stop you, because at this point, you've now entered ambiguous territory. And Go is notoriously against ambiguity, unless it's in the spec where they refer to embedding by two different names. So the compiler will basically say, hey, you can't do that. That's an ambiguous selector. That selector is illegal, and I'm going to stop you from even compiling this program, because come runtime, I'm not going to be able to tell which one you actually wanted me to talk to, which one you actually wanted me to send that request down to. And the thing is, the more types you embed, the greater the surface area becomes for you to reach the sort of ambiguous conflicts. So the more things that you grab in and the more things you bring into that embedding hug, the more likely it is, depending on how they're defined, that parts of those things are going to become unusable or behave in ways that maybe you didn't necessarily intend or predict. And embedding isn't just limited to things in your own package, obviously. Uh, you can embed things that are exported from other packages. Um, however, like you can't define two types, or rather, like you can't embed two types from the same package into the same struct, you also can't embed two things from different packages that have the same name. So again, the name that Go chooses when it chooses to embed something is the unqualified name. So, you know, pkg.t and pkg2.t, in terms of embedding, are basically the same thing with how Go considers them with uh, embedding or promoting anonymous types. And so one interesting thing that you might ask is, what happens to unexported fields and methods from an exported type? And there's actually what you might call a bug in Go lodged about this uh, a long time ago. Uh, it's bug 4876 on GitHub, or issue rather, say 4876. And I would encourage people, if you're curious, to just go take a look at it. Um, it's, it's actually very interesting. And they fixed it in what I would consider to be one of the most Go ways possible which is that there is a comment around it that says that it behaves in an unreliable way for certain inputs, and you should not use it if you're trying to find out about unexported fields from a, pack, from a type from another package. So it's basically broken as intended. Uh, it's actually very, very interesting, and I have in my embedding talk repo, there is a set of examples that you can do that will invoke this problem. It will create a set of uh, structs, embed them, and it will use reflect to sort of show you what happens in the reflect package when you try and find out about unexported types or unexported fields or methods. Uh, there was a little bit too much code for me to put on the screen. It wouldn't have really made sense, and it would have been too small to read. Um, but I would encourage people, if you're curious, to go take a look uh, at some of the examples in the embedding talk, um, because they do cover uh, some of those interesting cases. The other thing is that you can embed interfaces and structs. You cannot embed structs and interfaces but you can embed interfaces and structs. Uh, the question is, why would you want to do this? And honestly, you probably don't, but you can, and there is a, at least one valid reason I can think of. And that is that you want to embed abstract behavior and not concrete behavior. The difficulty there is, though, if you don't create the object correctly, if you don't provide a backing type for one of those interfaces, the compiler doesn't isn't going to detect that. The runtime is going to detect it when you go to call that method, and it's going to panic, because that's going to give you basically a nil pointer exception. So while the compiler can't save you from this, the runtime is definitely going to have a problem with it. So if you go down this road, be very, very careful about how you construct objects, because you could accidentally wind up with nil pointer exceptions where you don't intend for them to be. So then what happens if you embed two or more interfaces, but specifically where they have duplicate or you know, sort of conflicting methods? So we'll go back to our dog training and breeding examples because the, they're working so well so far. And you could have two types of dog behaviors. You could have a patient dog, and you could have a hyper dog. Both dogs know how to sit, although the hyper dog can't sit for very long. The patient dog knows how to stay and the hyper dog knows how to bark at you, or speak, rather, I guess is the appropriate term. 
And you still have your super corgi that you're working on, because why would you give up that dream? It's the dream of everybody. And so instead of embedding directly a Pembroke and a cardigan, you embed the concepts of a patient dog and a hyper dog. Because sometimes you want your dog to behave, and other times you want your dog to cut loose and have fun, because he's a dog, and dogs are awesome. And so you might define sort of an abstract set of behaviors for a Pembroke and for a cardigan. And for a Pembroke, because they're very good boys and they're very well behaved, like my dog, uh, it knows how to sit and it knows how to stay. But for cardigans, who, you know, maybe they're a little bit more rambunctious, a little bit of the bad boy in the block, they know how to sit and they know how to speak. And you sort of compose these training exercises where you're going to run through all the stuff a patient dog can do, and you're going to run through all the stuff a hyper dog can do. And you want to put your super corgi through this training exercise. The problem is you can't. Because when you embed multiple interfaces, and those interfaces have, uh, or result rather, in ambiguous selectors, you basically get the worst of both worlds. You, 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 you almost get nothing in that case. Um, so what happens is you can't call the sit uh, method, obviously, because it's an ambiguous selector, and you can't call ambiguous selectors. Uh, but also, you can't pass that object into something that expects that interface anymore. Because of how promotion works, that object, even though it inherently embeds the interface, and it provided a backing implementation for that interface, it no longer meets the definition of the interface or can't fulfill it, because promotion and the promotion rules have prevented those methods from being promoted upward due to the ambiguity. And you actually get two different errors when you try to pass in something where promotion has effectively hamstrung your ability uh, to use interfaces. The first error you get is that sit is ambiguous, or, one, or the, the method or the function is, is ambiguous. And that makes sense because it is. The second one you get, though, and this is probably a little more confusing until you sit and think about it, is that you can't use your super corgi as a patient dog or as a hyper dog because it does no longer implement the methods that are on that interface. Even though you have them there, you can go and look at them, you can go and see them and touch them, and depending on how you want to do it, you might even be able to invoke them individually on the behavior classes. You can't actually do it through the promoted class anymore because they just, they didn't even make it into the method set. The method set is so strict that once one method goes in and another method that meets the same name goes in, both get evicted. And this is what it looks like to the compiler. So not only is the selector ambiguous, but the interface is basically no longer met. And the same thing is true for the other function as well. So it doesn't really matter which interface you try to use there. The caveat to that, though, is other interfaces that don't have this ambiguous aspect to them, uh, that you might happen to implement you know, by accident, which is how most inter interfaces work. You, know, you just happen to implement them, and you can pass them around. Those still work just fine. So you haven't really broken your ability to use the struct as an interface. You just can no longer use it as the interfaces you wanted to due to the ambiguity. So if you want to go down this road of embedding interfaces to define abstract behaviors and not concrete behaviors, you need to be a little bit more careful and a little bit more selective of what you choose to embed. Because at the end of the day, you could end up with basically something that doesn't implement any of the interfaces, no matter how hard you tried. Another interesting place where you get into some edge cases with Go and embedding is marshalling and unmarshalling, specifically with JSON. Um, there are actually a lot of code examples that I have in the repo that, again, wouldn't really fit on the slides. Uh, but I'll sort of walk through the problem with them here. Um, so when you're marshalling data, you can expose and receive data for embedded types. And that, that works just fine. There really isn't a problem with it. If you have something that uh, embeds a cuteness level into a corgi, you can then receive that value in JSON at the, at the top level of the object and marshal it in, and it, it, works, it works just fine. If you choose to, which you can, you could add a marshalling struct tag to the embedded field definition. Uh, the problem is that this will very drastically change the behavior of marshalling. And so I don't want to tell you that this is necessarily wrong to do, because there are actually reasons why you might want to do this. I think a lot of times we forget that the world isn't Go talking to Go talking to Go. 
a lot of times, especially for people who are just kind of introducing Go into their company stack or just getting started with Go, you're consuming from some other service, Ruby or .NET or Java or something else, or you're producing data for one of those systems to consume. And a lot of times, you can't quite match things up just the way you want it. So you might choose to you know, mimic something in Go by way of composition and embedding, which is a perfectly valid choice for Go. But that isn't how it looks like on the other side uh, of the wire. And so you might need to do things like add struct tags so that it looks more like a traditional property. Because if you were to add a struct tag, uh, all of the things that would be marshaled at that top level now become underneath a property that is defined by that struct tag. So it's a way to sort of reclaim the idea of, instead of embedding this type, when we marshal it, I just want to treat it like a regular property, or a regular field, I, guess I should say. Um, and you can also override and block out the underlying marshaling behavior of the things you've embedded. And I actually have an example of where I've used this in my production stack, uh, a little bit closer to the end of the talk. Um, but you can override and change that behavior if you need to. So another way that you could use embedding if you needed to is to slightly alter the way or the things that you marshal in and out of structs. Um, and there's, there's really a lot of different ways you can go about this. Uh, in one of the examples I have, uh, there's basically sort of four or eight different ways that you can choose to define a struct, marshal the data, and then receive that same payload of data into one of the different definitions of that struct in terms of how the struct tags are laid out or how the JSON was laid out. And most of them work fine, but there are a couple of edge cases where if you have a struct tag that is, uh, you have a struct that embeds a field that has a tag on it, um, and you receive data in a way where there was no tag, that does not, or where, where there was not, uh, it was not treated as a separate property, that does not marshal as cleanly as you might think. It, Go doesn't really figure it out. It does figure out some of it, but it doesn't quite work the way you would expect. And then conversely, if, if you do the opposite, if you have uh, a struct without a tag and you try to receive all of the data in uh, underneath the property, basically all that ends up in the embedded type, but none of it ends up promoted or exported out at the top at the shallowest step. So when it comes to embedding in JSON, you need to be really, really careful about how you define stuff and how you receive data. Uh, and again, I would urge people to go look at the code examples I have. I don't want to keep telling people, hey, go to, go to some other thing to look at the information. It really is complicated enough that there isn't really a good amount of screen real estate to show you all that code. Um, it just kind of looks cluttered. But there are a couple of examples there that will walk you through and sort of demonstrate, here are the mistakes you could make when you're trying to integrate with another system and consume that JSON or marshal it out to another system. And so. I tricked you because there's also some cool pictures of my cat. Um, so for better or worse, and one of these cases is definitely worse, um, there are a couple of ways that I've used embedding. And I think it's always kind of helpful to include some practical examples when you're talking about stuff like this. So sort of like that last thing I described with the JSON marshalling, this comes into play with what you might call view models. Uh, you may know them as other terms like presenters. Um, but basically, just to define it real quickly, a view model is you would never really want to send uh, a database model directly from your database out over your REST API. You kind of always want to wrap it in something else, either because you need to add stuff to it or because you need to restrict the information that gets sent out over the wire. Um, you don't always want to just expose all your raw underlying data. And oftentimes, your front end doesn't accept the raw models from the database. It accepts sort of a specially crafted payload or a package. And a view model is one way you can do that. And embedding is a way that you can accomplish building view models in Go pretty effectively. Um, another point I want to make, and this is an entirely different talk, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but please don't ever bind your request data blindly to a model that you're going to save to a database. Uh, you're, you're asking for somebody to like, ruin your data and get security problems and screw over your customers. So like, don't, don't ever do that. Um, but a better idea is to embed things into view models, or if you're accepting data back in from an uh, external source, uh, a, a typed request. Um, and what you can do is you can use promotion semantics, some of the stuff that we've been talking about here, to hide the private information that you don't want to expose to the front. Uh, and like I called out, you're going to want to watch out for some of the weird marshalling and unmarshalling behaviors that I have laid out in those samples. Uh, so how this might look, and this is a rare non-dog-based example, I apologize, uh, but a very common thing that you would have is a user, right? And that user is going to have a username, they're going to have a password, and for some reason, we are a service that collects dark secrets. 
Uh, and you don't ever want to expose the dark secret or the password to the front. And there's a lot of ways that you could accomplish this. And there's a couple of blog posts out there that even go a little bit further than I have and sort of define this special omit type that you can use to kind of very statically declare that these are omitted fields. Um, I don't really know, in my opinion, if that's necessary. I think a simple comment kind of does the same thing. But what you can do is if you make a user view, which embeds the user, you can then override the fields you don't want to marshal out so long as you never touch them in the user view and you never set them. You can basically override those by giving them the same name and just adding omit empty to them. And there's a couple, like I said, there's a couple other ways you'd accomplish this, and there's a few ways that you could take this even further, but this is essentially the bare minimum. One thing that does not work is using the, the hyphen to basically say, don't marshal this at all, because the marshaller is a little smarter than you, or a little craftier than you is probably the right way to say it, and it will go and find the stuff that's found just a layer deep. It will continue to dig as it goes through and recursively marshals the, the struct. Um, so you can't just sort of say, hey, JSON hyphen to say, don't do any marshalling of this whatsoever. Uh, it will ignore you when it comes to embedded structs anyways. So you have to basically redefine the field, and you have to give it a very special set of tags, which is the field name, and you have to make sure that you omit empty. Otherwise, it's going to end up in the marshaled data, and people are going to see your passwords and your dark secrets, uh, and you don't want anybody to see either of those. Another way that you can... Uh, that you can use embedding, and this is something that we did uh, at my current company when we built uh, our SDK, is that you can use it to extend generated code. And this does sort of get in a little bit more. You could do basically the same thing with a classical inheritance model. Um, but one of the really cool things about Go is that files don't matter, right? The Go file that you write code in doesn't really mean anything. You could put a million lines of Go in a single file, and you could put a million lines of Go in a million files, and they're both fine because really it's the package that matters. And everything inside of the package is a friend, it can see every, everything else, and it can talk to everything else. And so one of the things that we did is that we defined this, uh, this spec in YAML for uh, building plugins for our, our, our product. And what you can do is you can define all the behaviors and the actions on the plugin, and you can generate uh, from that spec, and then you get a completely working Go application that can be run as a binary or run as a REST application, and it uses all that structure that you defined to generate Go structs. But one of the problems is, is that people wanted to extend those. They wanted to add their own custom code to it. And so what we did was, for every type we generate, T, we generate another type or another file, another type in another file, let's say, called custom T. And T embeds custom T. And if there's nothing in custom T, it doesn't matter. Go doesn't really care. It doesn't stop you or say, hey, you're trying to embed an empty struct. You shouldn't do that. There's no point to that. But what it lets you do is it lets you isolate all the user-defined code in one file and all the structural scaffolding code in another file. And so you can regenerate that file over and over and over and over and over again, and you're never going to have any user code lost. And now, you could accomplish that through other ways, too, right? You could be really smart, and you could do static analysis, and you could, you know, uh, figure out where the custom code is, either by leaving comments and figuring out you know, where to stop and start, or by you know, uh, analyzing the code and just determining what has changed and what hasn't. Um, I'm personally not that smart, uh, so this worked really well for me. And we use this to be able to add custom behaviors to these types that we were creating as we needed to. And so one of the things that we sort of ran into was we have more than one language that we support. We support Go and Python. Again, please hold your booze. Uh, so we need to make sure that any spec that we write is able to generate code for either language, which means that we can't embed any language-specific libraries or types. They have to be very generic. So in case we need to, we can simply drop one language and port a plugin over to another language completely. And so because of this, we have to have these ability to customize them through these custom T, custom T uh, structs, because otherwise there'd be no way to open a connection pool or a persistent connection to a downstream service and attach that so that it can be used for the life cycle of that object. Otherwise, you'd have to make it new you know, every single time. You'd have to redefine that every time you regenerate the code. Um, and by breaking things apart, you prevent yourself from ever blowing away your user's code or ever blowing away your custom code. And you get to maintain that scaffolding code as much as you want. You can regenerate it every time, and you're never going to lose your user's custom code. You could 
make a claim that maybe the user wants to regenerate the scaffolding, uh, the custom code because maybe something's changed or you know, they just want to get rid of it, and you could always include that option. But one of the most successful things that we do in our SDK is we make extensive use of embedding to make a line in the sand beyond, between this is the code that we generated that nobody should touch, and this is the code that the user gets to do whatever they want with, and we are never going to touch it. And embedding was a really, really good solution uh, for that. And it lets them upgrade our code anytime they want to. So if we release a new SDK that fixes a bug or adds a new feature, they can then go casually add that feature in or implement it themselves without losing any of their existing custom work. Uh, and an earlier version of our SDK did not have that feature, and people absolutely hated it. So once we went in and had the ability to not lose your work every time you use the SDK, uh, it got a lot better and got a lot more traction, surprisingly. Uh, and so a not fun example, and this is sort of what I alluded to when I first tried to do embedding uh, when I came to Go, is that promoted methods are only called on their original receiver. And here's how this bit me. Uh, we were porting some code from Ruby to Go, and because of the time, everyone had told me embedding is better, it's superior, it works just the same, and you should use it, forget about inheritance, that's the old way, your new life is Go, just take the plunge and do embedding. Uh, and so I expected that to just work, and it didn't. And the way that this bites you is like this. If you have a method, uh, or a type rather, T, that embeds a type E, and both of those methods have, uh, or rather, uh, uh, E has method M1, and both of those uh, structs, E and T, have M2. If you call M1, which was promoted up through E, M2 is never going to be called on T. M2 is always going to be called at the same depth that the original method was called on. So once you embed something and you start going down the method chain, you can't ever get back up. You can only move to the side or further down. There's no reference back to the parent, because it's not a parent. That's not how it works. And there's no way to sort of refer back to it. Now, you could potentially try and construct a really weird situation of tracking references and having links back to the thing that embedded you, but you probably don't want to do that either because that sounds like a nightmare to maintain and you're probably just going to add a ton of bugs. Um, so the thing to always remember is that when you're calling a method on a, that has been promoted through something else, everything else that that method does is going to work on the depth that it existed on originally it will never jump back to the top to start looking down again for the next method call. And I lost, uh, I think, something like a week or two of my life on that one because I went through and I, we ported this, we had sort of these calculators, and I have an example of this in my, in my code slides, um, these calculators for determining, uh, you know, revenue shares, and certain companies, certain partners want certain amounts taken out, and at the end of the day, they all calculated the same thing, because of the way method dispatch works. And that was on me because at the time I hadn't read the spec and I hadn't really understood what embedding was. And so that caught me pretty hard. Uh, and so if there's one takeaway, it's be very, very cognizant of where your receivers are, where your methods are received, uh, because that could inadvertently bite you in the ass. So to summarize all this, which is sort of the last 40 slides or so condensed to three, um, embedding is not better than inheritance. It's just different. And the spec itself is kind of light on details and examples. Uh, and it also refers to them by two names, so make sure you look for both names uh, when you want to go read through the spec to determine what the actual behavior is. Selectors and method sets themselves are pretty simple, but in my opinion, promotion is where it gets tricky. Uh, and you can embed interfaces, but it does get kind of weird, so maybe you don't want to do that too much. You also don't, in my opinion, ever want to touch the embed dead type. You only want to touch the embedding type. So the thing that gives the big hug, you only want to work through that. You never want to work through the things that were being hugged. Methods and fields are always called respective to their original receiver. But once you go down that receiver chain, you can never go back up. You're only ever going to go to the side or further down the embedding chain. So don't ever expect it to work sort of like you know, abstract classes or abstract methods work in other languages. It, it just flat out doesn't work that way because it wasn't designed that way and it wasn't designed to solve that problem. Uh, and there's lots of ways to use embedding and it's, like I said, not just a replacement for inheritance. You can use it to extend your code in really interesting ways. Uh, you can use it to build interesting features into your products. 
You can use it to protect data from uh, public endpoints. There's a lot of ways to do it. Don't just think of it as another or a different type of inheritance, because that really isn't the full story. Um, and once you embed a value, again, never touch it. Only interact with the embedded types via promotion. And it's way, way, way too easy to inadvertently do the wrong thing. Uh, or you could just throw caution to the wind, because I'm not the Go police. Thanks. <laughs>